So this month's program is awesome and I want to get right to it. Um, Rita Mitchell is a longtime HVG member, leader and activist, as well as a member of the Ann Arbor Environmental Commission. Eileen Dickinson is a physical therapist and Traeger practitioner, as well as a fabulous gardener and a pollinator educator. I think they have lots more attributes, but they can introduce themselves. They're both passionate about pollinators, as you will see, and please take it away. Una, <clears throat> excuse me. Una, are we in a good location? Just a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. We're trying to be on camera. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rita Mitchell. I am, uh, as Dan said, I am a member of the Ann Arbor Environmental Commission. I serve as vice chair, and I'm the lead on the pollinator work group for that particular commission. Um, and I've worked with Eileen Dickinson on a program that was called Be Safe Ann Arbor, and it led to this kind of presentation. I don't know if you want to say something. Yeah, I'll say something more about that. We canvassed uh, mostly our neighborhood in Worcester Park on the Old West Side in Ann Arbor, and we were looking for 75 contiguous, oh, oh 75 contiguous neighbors that would agree to not using neonicotinide chemicals and uh, not use pesticides on their lawn and that would pledge to plant pollinator plants. And we achieved that in our neighborhood. We also trained a lot of volunteers in other neighborhoods, but they never got off the ground. And Rita and I got worn out and that was just for two years or 2016 to 2018. Yeah. I'll also say that um, I became a master gardener in 1981 um, and then moved out of state and then came back. And maybe one of my distinguishing uh, credits is that I'm a neighbor of Dan. So. <laughs> So we want to talk about supporting pollinators in your neighborhood and our background that you just heard of, of Be Safe Ann Arbor is an example of that. So currently, I think we were early proponents of something that's now called pollinator pathways because we were trying for that contiguity of, of yards where people would actually not have boundaries for the pollinators that live in their space. Um, what got us onto this was what you've heard. Pollinators threatened by all kinds of things, loss of habitat, chemicals, um, extinction, and it's happening. And this just came across in my email this week from Environment Michigan. There are a lot of groups who are now working to support pollinators and their habitats. And I, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background on this. I came to this from, from being a more conventional garden where I, gardener where I bought and planted plants that I thought were pretty or had a cute name and just kind of had a collection of plants. And it was kind of like a painting with plants. Um, and I shifted over, I got exposed to native plants through the wild ones, uh, native plant group and kind of did the same thing. I collected plants and I put them in place and some of them grew and some of them didn't. But I got interested in pollinator gardening and I put one in in Worcester Park near where we live. And it when it, the connection came with the pollinators and the plants and how they need each other, it was just like this whole different reason to garden. It becomes a purpose and that's what it became for me. Um, pollinators, they're all kinds. Um, they're little sweat bees, bats, birds, people sometimes. You've probably heard of people pollinating in China with paintbrushes. Not too efficient, but they do it because the pollinators are not so prevalent in some areas. Fortunately, we still have pollinators, but we do need to keep help them. Um, so this is just a real basic thing. Where do pollinators live? Underground. They live in stems. They, um, native pollinators are ones that live in different places, but they're different from honeybees because they don't have the same kind of hive and they don't have 
the, the care that's provided them as honeybees do. And so um, you all may have heard recently of, um, you may have heard this too, about a, a new, um, oh, what is it called? A, kind of a vaccination they called for honeybees against um, some viruses. Mm -hmm. And um, it's provided to the queen bee and, and comes through with um, how, as she feeds her her young or, or pro provides their food. And um, the thing is that that's great for honeybees, but there isn't a similar thing for native bees. And we have a lot of native bees. There are 4,000 in the U United States or North America, 400 species in Michigan, and that's just bees. There are all those other pollinators that need space. I don't know if you want to add anything here. Yeah, I would say that that the native uh, bees are solitary bees. They are not social. They're not like ants who live in a colony or honeybees that live as a super organism in, in a thing. These are all solitary bees and they really need their habitat. They need the leaf litter. They need the old rodent holes. They need, they need soil that isn't covered up by mulch. Um, yeah, um, and they sometimes are specialized to the plant. And so that's why um, we, we talk about native plants specifically because some of them are in a shape that's specific to a particular pollinator based on the length of the tongue of the bee or, or the shape of the other insect. Um, pollinators pollinate all kinds of things. And these are our food, some of our food items, tomatoes. Um, Pumpkins are and squashes are pollinated by squash bees, and there are all kinds of fruits that like cherries, apples, blueberries that are pollinated by bees. Um, tomatoes are interesting because they're often pollinated by bumblebees, and bumblebees do this thing called buzz pollination, which is really cool. And I, this is going to be a problem. I don't have an mm. optimization thing. Oh, wow set up. I don't know. Okay, we're going to do a test. I don't know if it's going to work on Zoom, you all, but we'll we'll give it a try. This is uh, a sample of buzz pollination when I get back to it. Oh, you're not going to hear it. All right. Up here, we can hear this bee buzzing. And when it moves, when it does that shaking, that's a different sound. It's a higher pitch sound and it's different from the flying sound of the bee. It's really cool. And what the bee does is grab the flower and shake the pollen out. It literally shakes it. It's not just brushing against the pollen. It's, it's a physical movement that, that makes the pollen come out. It's pretty cool. Um, and this is a, a wild senna plant that is a stand in right now for me for a tomato plant because they do this on this wild center plant, which is really a cool one. Um, I want to make the point that insects are food and they they help us with food. So we need insects to support birds and other wildlife. They are major source of nutrition for baby birds growing up. Um, Professor Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware has studied specifically chickadees, and he has said that it takes between five to 8,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of chickadee babies. So that's like maybe four eggs, two little parents flying back and forth, and they fledge. I don't know, any birders here know how long a chickadee la you know, takes to fledge? <laughs> Three weeks, or so. three weeks. Can you imagine that many trips to the grocery store, you know, to get food for your babies? And what they have to do is they have to find it in the environment. And it's really important. They like caterpillars because caterpillars are soft. They can stuff them down the neck of, of their baby um, easier than, a, let's say, like a sharp um, uh, exoskeleton beetle. You know, it's like this, this little caterpillar can go down. Um, and provide a lot of nutrition. Uh, and so there we have it. And so then the other part of this is that the insects and caterpillars need food. So this is my example of like, um, I call it plant choice matters. It really, it's comparing a red oak and a chinkapin oak. And I like it because it shows the holes in the leaves of the red oak, which is a native tree of Michigan. 
And those holes were caused by some kind of insect or caterpillar because it needed food. It found it in, in this native source. Oak trees are known to have, I don't know, three to 500 insect species on them and provide a lot of habitat for birds and other animals. They're really important. A ginkgo biloba tree is an import from China. And I don't know if you can tell really well from this photo, but these leaves are perfect. There is not a hole in there. And there, that means really that there's no food in them for a bird. So if you were a bird, which one would you wanna live in? Where would you make your nest? It's an important kind of question. You know, when we think about how we plant our city trees, for example, what are the choices that we're making? It would be great if our city um, used more native trees than they do. And we were advocating that. We were talking about that on the way over. Um, jump in anytime you want. I will. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, here we have threats to pollinators. Why are we worried about them? As I said in that earlier slide, there's lots of habitat, lack of food because of the way we garden or take care of our yards. Um, there may be introduced plants that are not compatible and that outcompete native plants and pesticides and climate change. So climate change is getting things out of sync for, for plants and the insects that need them for food and habitat. So it's a serious problem. And um, this is a kind of a discussion slide. Um, this is a really beautiful country road. Um, and I'm just going to say that this to me, when I look at it, I, it makes me a little worried. Um, this is a, a, a road that has kind of groomed, uh, uh, grooming on the sides, the, the um, mowing, and I don't see any flowers. I don't see any milkweed. I don't see any bee balm no um, black-eyed Susans, there's nothing there. And it's next to a cornfield that is a wind-pollinated type of plant. And the corn and other crops are often um, treated with herbicides, pesticides, if not by a spray, very often in the seed themselves as they're planted. And those, those seeds um, end up being the, creating a plant that can have some neonicotinoid or other chemical inside it that is a problem for the, for the insects. So the only thing that might be food for insects that I see in this picture is the tree. Maybe, maybe there's some flowers in that particular tree. I'm not sure what it is, but you know, it's kind of desolate. Same kind of thing here. So this is a really common kind of yard that is barren of food for a pollinator. Um, you may not, it's not really easy to see, but there's some little red flowers on the plants that have the, that are in this little, these pots, um, but there's not very much food. So it's really um, been called a food desert for bees, pollinators, other, other insects, because there's really no food for them. There's no place for them to create a home. Kind of hard. Uh, this is another example of out competing native plants with invasive plants. So garlic mustard, you know, grows really densely. It out competes plants, other plants that come up in the same season and shades them out and produces a chemical called an allelopathin pathogen um, that is actually a, a chemical that reduces the growth of other plants around it. Um, and very often, I have, I've picked a lot of garlic mustard, and there are hardly ever any holes in those leaves. So it's not a plant that provides, even though it's great and prolific and green and kind of pretty and actually edible, um, it's not that great for pollinators. Um, another thing that happens in our gardens is that um, this is just an example showing the contrast between a a hybrid coneflower that has this, it's kind of pretty and it looks like a little mop top, um, but compared to the native coneflower, the bee that you see on, on the native coneflower can get right to the nectar and to the pollen that's available. And on the on the other side, the other the hybrid one, um, it's just 
too crowded. Like this, this is an example of something that doesn't really, that is really challenging for uh, a pollinator to get to its pollen. Another reason that we really like the native plants. Okay, so threats. This is where I need you guys. I mean, oh. <laughs> Eileen really knows the neonicotinoids. Yeah. So um, we need to um, reduce the use of chemical uh, pesticides that are applied on gardens, on seeds, and um, nursery plants, because the, when those plants and seeds are treated with neonicotinoids, that is a, a systemic kind of chemical that is poison for the insects. Mm -hmm. And when those are placed on the seeds and plants, they spread. Um, sometimes they're applied with as a spray, they might spread by wind um, and drift. They can be persistent in the soils. So if they're applied at one time, they might be there the next year. And they can get into the water system. So yeah. yeah. And and they they are in every part of the plant. So if you plant plants that have been treated by these, then the pollinators are getting it through the nectar and the pollen that they're collecting. And then it it creates disorientation. It's basically a neurotoxin. So honeybees may not make it back to the hive. Others, you know, die after they eat the honey or the pollen that the native bees have fed their larva or whatever. Um, we, when we did Bay Safe Neighborhood, we made little wallet cards that had all these chemical names on, and we asked people to take them when they were plant shopping to ask people if the plants had been treated. And most people that buy in plants, like a wholesale, you know, they get them from wholesale, they don't even know if they've been treated. So a lot of times you have to go to the wholesaler to find out. It's really hard to track it down. There is a nursery um, in Northville that says they don't treat any of their plants with pesticides, but the ones they do order in, they can't vouch for. So yeah. that's another place where you've probably heard it or practiced it yourself, where you need to know your grower. Um, and there, luckily, we're in really fortunate in our area to have some native plant growers that are that produce really good plants and that that are available to us around here. Got some on the list. Um, so, what can you do? Um, I call this the do no harm approach, which is really starts out with no pesticides. Um, I don't think I've ever used a chemical on my yard ever um, because I don't feel a need for doing that. Um, planting natives is a really good thing because those plants support the native pollinators. They're good for honeybees as well. Um, and plant for flowering throughout the season. Um, and just as Eileen just said, watch where you buy your plants and talk to the growers. I think if I saw a plant that was available to buy and it looked really perfect, I guess I would question whether I would want it, you know, kind of like the ginkgo tree that had no holes in the leaves. Um, I really like this new, this thing that has been introduced to leave the leaves in the fall, leave the debris, um, try to change the, the way you look at your yard and think of where, where a pollinator or other, or a, a wild, any kind of wildlife might want to live. Um, and it's not in one of those really tightly, tightly manicured yards. Um, we really advocate reducing use of turf grass, like that one picture in the home that, that you saw. Um, and yeah, go yeah ahead. I'll just add yeah. that I have a package of bee lawn seed over here, and that's what I planted in my front yard in May. It's a mix of fescue and several kinds of fescue, uh, self heal, and white Dutch clover and creeping thyme. And you mow it four times a year, and it's supposed to bloom throughout the summer. So it's produced uh, by a company uh, up in Minnesota if anybody's interested. 
Yeah, so there are alternatives. So having the just the solid green velvety looking yard is really um, from the perspective of a pollinator, a honeybee, a bumblebee, um, not so attractive. So we, we're looking for some variety. Um, and I'll just say, this is my aesthetic, which has changed over time, um, that I am more attracted to yards that have the, the variation in the color that and the blooms throughout the year. So I'm hoping that um, some other people will join in that kind of thought about about their yards. Um, another thing is to create stick piles um, and just really um, native plant gardening is changing in a way to, to not necessarily clear out all the debris at the end of summer. Um, I leave my stems through the winter. I cut them back a little bit in the spring to maybe 15 inches or varied heights um, and leave stems for stem nesting bees. And what happens is the vegetation grows up in the season and covers those stems anyway. You don't see it ultimately. So it's just a different approach. Um, and there's a program called No Mow May. You might wanna join in that, which is just delaying when you mow your lawn in the spring to give the pollinators a chance to kind of wake up, find some early spring flowers, and then you can move on with your, your gardening plan. Ideally, you'll um, consider increasing your flower garden space and reducing any turf grass that you have. So, and this is just a, a kind of an idea of like, well, what goes through the season? So you can see here some um, uh, blood root coming up through leaf litter in the spring, some wild geranium and pussy toes, some of my favorites, some uh, columbine, and then at the end of summer, um, New England aster. There are a lot of other plants, um, but these are good ones that grow here. I'll add that MSU is a really good resource. MSU Extension has a lot of information on native plants for pollinators, and they have it sorted by color and by season of bloom and height. Um, I have one reference over there. Um, I will also add in my very favorite pollinator plant, which is a mountain mint. It's a native plant. It's called Pignanthemum muticum, and it blooms from the end of July until frost. And it is covered with native bees, all kinds of wasps and honeybees. And it's, you can just sit by it and watch it all day. And an entomologist, I think he's a friend of yours, Dan, David Cappert, um, posted a video <laughs> online of a day in August on that, that plant, and he found 57 species of pollinators on there. Um, I can give you the link if you're interested. Um, related to this is um, there's a program called the Homegrown National Park that was uh, a brainchild of Doug Tallamy again, um, which is similar to our Be Safe Ann Arbor. This is a man who's suggesting that we join him and you can look it up online, Homegrown National Park, um, and sign up and say, this is my yard, I'm, I'm gonna give you my address and they'll put a little dot on the map um, nationally for us. And the goal is to reduce some of the 40 million acres of turf grass that we have in the United States and change it into spaces that can support pollinators because they support us. Um, this is just a list which I can give to you, Dan, or you, Una, um, to just some references for local resources of plants in our area and design design work. Some people might want to have some help with like thinking about how they would, what they would like to put in the yard and where. Um, more resources, I don't know, probably not too visible, I'm sorry, um, but organizations. The Sierra Club is one, and I, uh, I think my next slide is that, but, but there are so many excellent organizations, wild ones, the Ann Arbor's Natural Area Preservation, um, nationally, the Xerxes Society is one of the best in terms of finding out anything about a pollinator. Um, the Sierra Club is this pollinator partnership. I'm going to shift over to that one. Pollinator protectors, sorry. Um, this is a, a group that is a national version of the, the pollinator protectors. It's um, 
the woman who's organizing it is out of New York State, um, but they're doing some really interesting work and they have a session tomorrow night you could sign up for um, if you search for pollinator protectors on the Sierra Club website. And in the end, you could have a yard that has a lot of pollinators in it um, and enjoy watching them. So there we are. So my point in all of this is that we are connected. We're connected with the pollinators. We need them for food. They're connected with us. We're all together and um, we need to work together, I think, to, to support the, the kind of space that is needed for these beautiful wildlife animals. Yeah. yeah, I have one more resource to add, and that is also from Michigan State, uh, Michigan State University. They have a program that's free. It's called Pollinator Champions, and you can take it online. Um, a number of different lessons. It's free, or if you want to be certified as a pollinator champion, you can spend $30. It's very informative. It talks about the plight of the pollinators, what they do, um, and what you can do to protect them. It's, it's definitely worth your time, I think. There are questions? So um, for the leaves, for the big trees, do you recommend that when they fall, I mean, they're huge piles. Do you recommend mulching them up to some level? Oh, yeah, thank you. The question is, should we mow leaves that fall in our yard, especially large volumes of leaves, I think was the issue. There's a concern about um, leaves usually killing grass. Um, and since I'm not so interested in grass, I don't care. I'll just say that's my opinion. <laughs> but um, but actually, I would say no. And the reason is that those leaves are protection for pollinators that fall from the trees themselves. There might be pupa or caterpillars that will hibernate underneath them over the winter. They're, they're, they're natural fertilizer, as they are. And most of them will decay in the next year. If it's really deep, I don't know six inches, eight inches, maybe I'd move some. Um, they get mad as they get to you. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I have a lot of trees. Uh-huh, so what kind of trees are they? Uh, maple. maple trees. Um, I'll tell you that what I have heard is mostly is that oak leaves are the ones that tend to last longer. So the question, the answer was maple trees are the ones in, in, in this particular yard. Um, oak leaves tend to be more, mm, structural and last longer. Um, I believe make, maple leaves would um, decay in a year, but you you could kind of, I, I think you have to decide. And there's probably a middle ground where you would move some of the leaves into say flower beds mm -hmm. over the winter so that they could provide some shelter in that space. Um, and then you can loosen them up in the spring, but mostly they decay is, has been by experience. Um, I don't know about oak leaves so much, but but they are also, it's like, you can kind of think of them as like a cycle of life. The leaves are from that tree. They have the nutrients that that tree needs and they are, they land there and they can be used right, right there. Good. I would, I would think the misground, a reasonable approach because, you know, People with, with oak or, or maple trees in the backyard, they're going to get you know, something that thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not totally against moving. So the question, or the comment was um, middle ground sounds like a good idea. And I think that that's fine. I, I don't like to be rigid about all of these things, but I do like to encourage people to um, consider leaving more leaves as opposed to when I see them now bagged up and along the street, my reaction is like, oh my God, you're sending next year's pollinators to the compost. Where are they, where do they, what's gonna happen? So th that's just sort of an opinion. Um, I'm, I haven't raked my leaves in the last couple of years, so I'm going to watch. And so I, I think you might want to watch, you know, choose your area and see what happens. And watch, and, and in that homegrown national park that I mentioned, um, it is being an observer in your own space is what's being encouraged. So you kind of learn like the 50 insects that might visit a plant in your yard, you know, to kind of slow down and spend the time to look at them. 
have like a couple questions on Zoom. Okay. Um, one is from someone raising their hand, Janine. I'm oh, sorry, the other question in the meantime is, can you discuss getting government agencies to stop planting grass for invasive or stop mowing roadsides and parklands? Should I say that again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the question is, should we get governments to stop mowing grass and putting in invasive plants? And, and um, mowing roadsides and parklands. And mowing roadsides and parklands. Um, I'll just say something that I know from the Ann Arbor parks is that they're going to be doing some more experimentation with that this year, um, not necessarily mowing all the areas that they're, they've, the Ann Arbor parks are planning to test out some once a mow area, once a year mow areas, some no mow may areas, and even some of the different kinds of grass plantings that Eileen described. So that's happening locally. Um, I, I I would say yeah let's let's go for it but but I, I I'm not really up to date on that particular answer for for like the state um, for example I would like to say that it would be great if if our county road commission would would take care along the roadsides um, with its mowing and and um, any herbiciding and I'd like to see some changes there um, and we can all influence those people I hope the road commissions. Do you want to? Yeah, and I would say contacting state um, representatives and senators is a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Dan? Is it hard to get up the courage to back on neighbor's doors and ask them to participate? And then what kind of response did you get? Yeah, uh, we had a lot of fun with it. We wore our little bee antenna. <laughs> we should have brought those. Yeah, oh. We had um, Be Safe neighborhood t-shirts and I made a little stuffed bumblebee in case we had kids at the door. And we had all of our literature and um, some houses there was a little trepidation because it was a food desert for pollinators, um, but people were really responsive. And um, I have on my, a PowerPoint that I did about Be Safe, how many people pledged at the highest level in our neighborhood. So I think we got a really good response. Um, and we were asking people um, to not use lawn chemicals and fungicides, and I call them biocides. I don't call them pesticides, because when you think of pesticides, you think you're getting rid of a pest but it kills everything. It's really killing life. And um, pollinators actually forage for fungus. You can see them on in mycelium on the ground. So yeah, no, I think we had pretty much a good response. It was fun. Yeah. I do have to say that it was fun going in, in as two, two people yeah. to do that at the door. Um, I think that made it easier for people to come to the door somehow. Um, and probably our antenna were helpful. Um, yeah. I have a I have a com um, comment. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, in terms of parks, I wasn't sure what would happen, but I asked the mowers first and they said to talk to somebody else if they would not mow the leaves in Burr Park last fall. And they actually didn't do it. They left them all. Um, right. So I think parks are open to requests like that. Um, I, cause I understand from Doug Talame, I think he's the one that said that if you leave them over the winter, um, then it will still support the insects in them. And if they have to mow in the sum in the spring, then at least they've gotten them through the winter and most of the insects will be okay. I think that sounds good. Thank you. Yes, and I can add another thing, Dan, to your comment. Um, one of my neighbors signed the pledge at the highest level, 
And then I noticed that their lawn service was spraying something on their lawn. And I texted them both in the moment. And I said, did you know your lawn service is spraying some kind of pesticide on your lawn? And they said, no. And they fired them. <laughs> so, yeah. It pays to speak up. Yeah. Can you tell whether there was a change in the amount of pollinators in the neighborhood as a result of what you did? Hmm. I don't think so. I can say that I have way more pollinators since I've been putting in plants for pollinators. Um, and I don't think Nomo May has had an effect on the number of pollinators yet. My assessment of Nomo May was that it gave great habitat to the neighborhood rabbits. <laughs> I've heard that too. But I do think one thing that Nomo May does is make people think differently about their lawn yes. space, mm -hmm. um, what can be done with it, maybe to tolerate something that's not that tightly trimmed grass. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard someone, I don't, maybe it was you, tell me that, that they had observed their neighbors mowing less mm -hmm. during the summer as a whole. Um, so I, those things are helpful. The other things that are um, helpful is just not having the noise the pollution, the compaction that go with mowing. Those are good things. And I want you to say that one of the things that, that I loved when we were um, doing our door-to-door -door thing was that we would say that um, the Be Safe program is good for pollinators, pets, and people. Mm -hmm. And the three Ps were kind of like pulled it, pulled it together. Um, in particular, um, I think about kids, kids and pets being on grass and grass that's treated. Um, it just doesn't make any sense, whatever. So it's an opportunity to um, use that space differently to treat, to educate children um, in, in various ways about the plants, about their pets, et cetera. So I wanna do is asking to repeat the kind of uh, the company and what kind of food you would have. Oh, the bee lawn seed. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's called a bee lawn seed mixture, and it's produced by Twin City Seed Company in Minneapolis, I believe. Um, can you see that? Yeah, and I'm typing it up. I bought it online. Yeah, it's with the company. It is um, it is Twin City Seed Company. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I asked Kelly at Downtown Home and Garden if she would carry this last year um, because I told her that a lot of people would be seeing my lawn and they would want some of it. <laughs> and it would be nice if they didn't have to pay the shipping on this. The shipping was expensive. Um, and you can also get this... Um, you can buy just the floral component and then you can overseed whatever area that you want to do. But I think it's better to start from a clean slate. Um, and mine doesn't look like much grass. It's a lot of self-heal right now and clover, which the rabbits really like. <laughs> what did she say about stopping? Uh, she said she would look into it. Yeah, I gave her the contact person. Mm -hmm. Could you encourage uh, both of us, sorry, downtown home and garden to actually carry more native plants and seeds in for uh, pollinators? I'd be happy to do that. Because I noticed they weren't on your list. We find more in Dexter Mill. Mm. But if downtown home and garden could be persuaded to carry more, mm -hmm. I think uh, that would be a very good way to, to disseminate uh, just the native pollinators and native yeah. plants. Mm -hmm. It'd be a good connection with the local growers too. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, that comment was our, our downtown home and gardens to stock native plants in there and seeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then someone was asking as a follow up does the bee lawn contain Michigan natives versus like Minnesota natives and what might be the concerns about that? Yeah, I think, well, I don't know if fescues are native. I don't know. Not be. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is a native bee lawn. It's a pollinator lawn. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But that in addition, that way. Yeah. Nancy? Is there, 
Nice. Uh, what do you think of the uh, annual uh, native plant expo? The Rockstar Conservation Academy uh, Conservation. Excellent. That was in the May or the yeah. Um, this is a question about the native plant expo at the Washington County Extension that sponsored it at the Chelsea Fairgrounds. Do you remember the date? It's June 3rd. It's June 3rd. I suggest you all go. It's excellent. There are growers from all over, not just our, our really local ones, but, but from broader areas. You can get a lot of really interesting plants. And I went last year. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, mid, mid COVID time. It was well attended. Um, I got some good plants. You can too. Oh, is, is there, um, uh, the local farmers markets, not just one in Ann Arbor, but some of those, are they, you know, a lot of cell flowers that they are spreading with it, are they, are they focusing on native plants? Or now, the question is whether or not the local farmers markets are focusing on uh, native plants. There used to be somebody, Greg, at, at the Ann Arbor Farmer's Market that sold native plants, uh, and I know they were untreated, but I don't think there are a lot of other native plant vendors there. Mm -hmm. We did approach vendors, though, at the market, and um, some of them displayed their Be Safe sign because they could, because they weren't treating their, their seedlings. So some organic growers of, of tomato plants and, and other um, vegetables, mm -hmm. um, I, We've come to appreciate the organic approach as opposed to some things that would potentially have been treated with neonicotinoids so that they look great when they're sold, but they may not be so great for pollinator. The other plants that are really good for pollinators are herbs. When you let your herbs bloom, like oregano and rosemary and all the mints and dill, dill and oh my gosh they love garlic chives they're a little invasive but they love garlic chives and they bloom late in the season so it's a nice late season um plant one last question then um zoom jay's do you know if elon will grow in shade do i know if what will grow in shade oh the bee lawn um I believe it can do in partial shade. The bee lawn can grow in partial shade. I have it in my front yard, which faces east, and there's a big maple tree there and, you know, all the street trees, um, and it grew fine. Yeah. I wouldn't put it in dense shade. Mm -hmm. Have you worked before with your rats? Let's please recognize these speakers. Thank you. <laughs> and I just want to testify just a little bit about each one of them. So Eileen is a great expert for the, our whole region, but she happens to live across the street from me. And during the pandemic, I would go over and watch her mountain and, and it was my entertainment. It was my field trip every day. It was just to go over there. It was like a nature show on TV of the highest order. And I don't know anything about pollinators. I'm starting to now because Eileen is, is teaching me, but you could easily tell that there were more than a dozen kinds of pollinators in there at any one time, as long as the sun was shining on the plant. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to recognize, I know Rita spent a lot of time trying to talk skeptical people into Nomo May, and it certainly... Uh, took off a lot more than I expected. As I rode my bike around town, I would see whole blocks where almost every where almost every lawn was shaggy, and they had never been like that before. And when I put your presentation on Facebook on my own personal page, one of my friends responded, "No more may change the way we look at our yard." And then he he told about some of the things that they had been doing already. He said we hadn't given as much consideration to the pollinators as as we did this year. We will continue the practice and how we view our property. Love you, bugs and bats. So all yeah. that all the advocacy is working. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if you want to start this, you know, at some level in your own neighborhood, these are these are the people to ask because they will steer you in the right direction. 
Thanks, so, Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> the other thing I'll add is that I have that mountain mint on the lawn extension or what used to be the lawn extension so everybody could see it. Um, and it's half a block from Ba School, so the kids are always walking by with their parents and almost always they stop and ask me what plant that is. So. And nobody's ever going to accuse either one of these two women of having a golf green type of, of lawn. Oh, no. They have beautiful, <laughs> but they have beautiful lawn. Thank you, Dan. So, uh, yeah. there, there's resources there and free on the back. Yeah, lots yeah. of lots of resources, and we'll have mixing and mingling. I think they'll stay for a little while mm -hmm. and talk to you. And uh, we had three dozen people on Zoom, so this was our biggest. This was our biggest meeting in a while. Oh, wow. Wow. wow! So yeah, thanks. Thanks again.